A few months back, my wife, Jennifer, who has been in Kansas City for the last two and a half weeks, and uh, she's coming back tomorrow. Yay! <laughs> Anyway, she went to an office supply store and picked up some supplies and, and brought home a little something that uh, we find humorous t uh, to share with each other because it, it's about giving life the light touch. And it sounds like this. That was easy. <laughs> Do you hear that? That was easy. <laughs> So it's definitely a, an intention for life and ease is a hallmark really of the art of living, of living well, of mastering certain tasks and doing well in life is about ease. And it's also a sign of allowing greater and greater good into our lives because it is a principle that the spirit, the creator, is absolute good and that we are essentially good and that through the cultivation of the awareness of that connection that our lives will be greater and greater expressions of ease. And yet, I came across a quote by a fellow traveler who lived in the same time as Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of the Unity Movement. His name was Dr. Carl Gustav Jung. And he developed, he was a Swiss psychiatrist, but he also developed and was a pioneer of analytical and depth psychology. And he said something very interesting one time. He said, I would rather be whole than good. I would rather be whole than good. And it was so interesting to me this morning when I opened up the daily word and the word of the day was wholeness. The whole of the unity movement is really focused on the good of God, and that when we apply these principles of truth, that greater and greater good will manifest into our lives, and that is the, in accord with the divine plan. And yet, the Daily Word and Dr. Jung talked about wholeness, that I would, be, I would rather be whole than good. And so what does that mean for us? Both of these men were very much into consciousness, into mind, into understanding mind. And Charles Fillmore stated that every Sunday message should include an aspect of psychology within it because it's one of those filters that we have to perceive with and that it is so important for us to have not only devotion and worship in our lives for our source but also to have self-understanding through psychology th through the mind that there's part of us that it's required to have a childlike trust but also to mature in our self-understanding of what we are. That the mental and emotional and physical aspects of self are to be understood. Not to just move through life with a trust and a faith but the unity faith tradition recognizes the good in all those, all traditions, whether they be focused on devotion or knowledge or the heart or 
karma yoga, which is doing work in the world. Like our friend and guest today, Grace Hahn, her focus is doing work in the world to improve the conditions of people that are challenged at home. And I can relate to this because my mother is at home in Arizona, almost 91 years old, and her quality of life is not so great most days. And I want that for her. She's a good lady, a good person. So, what's the payoff with this inquiry into the psyche, which is the root of the word psychology? The psyche. Well, for, for instance, if we cultivate an understanding of the emotional life, then we are less prone to react, but more to respond to life. We are more in the ability to be the witness of the mind versus being the victim of the mind. We can go from being a victim to victor, victor, and then in time and according to the timing of the soul, we can become a venerable teacher of consciousness, of what it is that we actually are. So there isn't really, at least for me, an emphasis on overanalyzing all of this. Some people in the audience may be very devotional in their approach to the Creator and looking at consciousness and trying to figure things out is not even on their radar. They just accept. And I love that about people. I love that childlike, and it's not even a childlike trust, but it's an understanding, and that's a beautiful thing. But that inquiry has always been there throughout the ages. The mystery schools of old have always been in the process of accepting new students to be initiates into the higher, deeper way of understanding the self. And if there's really a core truth or a vein of truth within unity, it is about understanding the self with a capital S. In order for it to spiritualize the self with a small s. And if I could surmise all of the teachings of the world that are worth their salt, so to speak, they would be a merging or a divine marriage of self with self. That is our journey. That is the hero's journey. That is the path of the overcomer. That has an archetype within each one of us. Each one of us has this imprint within us to be the hero of our own life, to be the overcomer of adversity and challenge. This past week, I will just disclose a bit of my own experience. It's always interesting when my wife goes away. I am, I get to sit with my own bones. I get to, to be with the mental and emotional content within consciousness. I like to be with it and sometimes I don't. You ever been there? Being with oneself is at times a great pleasure and sometimes it's hard. Because we're faced with those aspects of self that are unhealed or unintegrated into 
a wholeness. And that's why Dr. Jung said, I would rather be whole than good. Because if we're in our wholeness, then our behavior will be automatically good. And that the, the young people of the day, we call them the millennial generation, are really not so dialed in to the prescription that has been given people of how to be in the world. They're not so attached to being good. They want to be whole. So they question the presumptions. They question the assumptions of how to act in the world, of how and why would they want to give their power away to other people and in the name of being good. But if they have something to offer that creates a place of wholeness within them, then they're on board. Yeah, I can sign up for that. I'm into being whole. And sometimes being whole is listening to their own inner being versus about what they should do. I admire that. There's a divine order in that because it has to do with shaking out and releasing old forms, old ways of being that are contrary, really, to naturalness of being. There is the hero's journey. And sometimes I bring in scripture, the letters of Paul, for instance, Paul in New Thought isn't a real popular guy because he's about at least how it was interpreted by the church fathers in the first 1500 years of Christianity was all about being good. But he was really about helping people to turn from the idolatry of the outer world to that which was within you. And he wrote a letter to the Colossians that basically said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But he also had his journey of doubts and fears. And he said, for the, and he wrote this as a letter. He said, for the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not do, that I do. That has a lot to do with psychology. He was perhaps one of the first psychologists. Because he, he questioned the mechanism of consciousness that even though he had an intention to do good he called it evil well in in more adept understanding teachings evil is something that is not what we think it is in fact in ancient Hebrew evil the word is biashut. And it simply means unripe fruit. Unripe fruit. So that indicates that there is a process of maturation that needs to take place and that you and I are all in that process. We are all in the process of matura maturation from being in an unripe state in terms of understanding into coming into an alignment with the higher self, the inner self, and we ripen into wholeness. 
And then our behavior is naturally one of goodness. Because we get it that the other is part of ourselves and part of our creator. So we're not being dictated to by the world that says you should be this way or you should be that. But we are living from the inside out. In fact, this inquiry is going from circumference to center and then out again in expression of joy, happiness, prosperity, radiant health, all of the good that is what the Spirit would have us be. Because that's how the Spirit sees us, as whole. We are whole in God mind. We are not lacking. We are not sinners. We're not bad and wrong. We're whole in the mind of God. You are perfect. All we need do is remember this. That's what spiritual education is about. To remember the truth of what it is that we are. I feel that the world is starving for this message. Because we all have such burdens on our backs about it says in Scripture also, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is in, in heaven is perfect. What a load of burden. But the ancient Eastern manuscripts by, interpreted by George Lamsa, it doesn't say be ye perfect. It says be ye whole. Be whole. How many people do we know that may include ourselves that we have struggled all our lives with perfectionism, having to be perfect in order to be okay in the eyes of our parents, in the eyes of our God? But what a refreshing message to say, I'm already whole in my God creator. I don't need to be perfect. How can we be perfect in our humanity anyway? We're perfectly imperfect. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a colorful and diverse universe. We can let ourselves off the hook for trying to be perfect. So we have these layers of self that are, we are endeavoring to allow an integration and a wholeness to be taking place. Unity as a faith tradition embraces all, all traditions because they all have truth in them. whether we're reading from the Bhagavad Gita or the Bible or the Course in Miracles. Some people in this room are Course in Miracles students and have been for many years. Some people have never cracked the book open. But I would be remiss in this whole process of wholeness if I wasn't speaking to the support that is required for us to be whole. Because we have these erroneous concepts of what it is that we think we are. Holding in mind that God mind already sees us whole, perfect. We haven't been born of original sin, we have been born, as Matthew Fox stated, of original blessing. Original blessing. The beauty of life is un, untainted, unadulterated, 
It is pure and wonderful, and we all are that too. I hope that your soul is listening. Mine is. Are we listening to the message of wholeness that's being shared in the room right now? So in the Course in Miracles, it talks about the Holy Spirit or the whole spirit of God. And I wanted to share just a brief word from the text. The voice for God is corrective, but it is not arrogant. It is the spirit of joy. The spirit of joy. And we have projected the Holy Spirit outside of us in the form of a white dove or some, something other than where we're at. But on page 75, in the text it says, the Holy Spirit is in you in a very real sense. It is the voice that calls you back to where you were before and will be again. Where we were before and where we will be again. The scriptures, the Bible, for instance, talks about where we were before and where we will be again. But the truth of the matter is, is that we never left the garden. We never fell. We just went to sleep. It's about waking up and being and living into the divine image of what it is that we are in truth. So sometimes this process doesn't seem easy. Is it worth the trip? I wouldn't have it any other way. Because off and on during the day, I don't know about you, but off and on during the day, there are frequencies of energy that come to me that remind me of the higher way. We make up this story that it's really hard. But all the while, the Spirit simply says, that was easy. God bless. Thank you.